My name is Mayo Moran. I have the great honour of being the 15th Provost of Trinity College, and I am delighted to welcome you to the 12th version of Conversations with the Chancellor. And uh, Kathy's looking, she goes, really, 12 already? I can't believe it. Um, and it, it is hard to believe. It's been something that I think has brought really important conversations to the life of Trinity College. The last one, as you may recall, was the uh, newly elected uh, chief of the AFN, Perry Bellegarde. We've had Louise Arbour. We've had General Rick Hillier. We've had Joe Clark. And we've had many wonderful guests. Just... I know I'm just humbling Andrew a little bit. <laughs> After Andrew's big week, I have to just bring him down a little. <laughs> now I must say, and I think it was Elizabeth Wilson's uh, thought, we, we thought that we were very smart getting Andrew Coyne to comment shortly after the federal election. And we organized this quite a, a while in advance and we were feeling rather smug about having organized it, but I don't think we really could have had any idea what great timing it was. And so, Andrew, we're thrilled to have you here. Chancellor, thank you again uh, for your generosity and your gracious hosting, and I will hand it over to you to introduce Andrew. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Provost, and uh, I think we've seen quite a few of your colleagues from your year here, Andrew, so I hope they're less rowdy now than they were uh, in those days when you and Gladwell and Balsillie and those characters. Sure got poured out at the end of this. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, exactly. The spoons are still flat from, uh, from all the problems, but uh, as many of you will know, Andrew was here at Trinity in the class of 83. Uh, he actually came here from the University of Manitoba, where uh, and we might ask him as to what, uh, what brought him here, but uh, he transferred to Trinity, where he got his Bachelor of Arts. He then went to uh, London School of Economics, where he got his uh, LLM. No, L or, uh, LL MSc. MS. Master of Science. Master of Science. What it's sort of science? science there. What it's an sort of here. science? Uh, uh, there was a lot of math, that's all I remember. <laughs> well, good for you. Uh, following his studies in Britain, uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he wrote for the Financial Post for six years before joining the Globe and Mail editorial board where he won two national newspaper awards for editorial writing. He then joined the, the staff of the newly launched National Post as national correspondent. He became editor of Maclean's magazine. An, an editor. I was the national editor, I was called. The national yeah, I wasn't, editor. I wasn't the editor. Who, was, who, who was, was White the editor in those days? Uh, Ken White was Ken the editor-editor and Mark Stevenson was the something subordinate to him. I think, I think Ken had the title of editor-in-chief and Mark was editor. I see. It's all, and, and you all were, title and, inflation. And you were the national editor. I was, the, I, was, I was what was called the national editor, yes. I see. As in the National Post, sort of the national editor. And, uh, <laughs> he went back to the National Post, becoming so used to this term. But I really think that uh, all of us are, know Andrew most from having watched him so often uh, on, on the CBC and are very grateful, Andrew, for your penetrating analysis into Canadian politics, and we're particularly grateful for you joining us tonight. That's so great thank you very much for coming. Thank it's you. great to have. More salacious details. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was where you were gonna ask me, what's Chantelle Hebert really like? <laughs> Somebody was asking you that on the way over. Which is what I get most of the time. Every now and then somebody will stop me on the street and say, you're that guy on TV, and, I'll, and I'm just about to simper. And they'll say, what's Chantal at Bear like? <laughs> <laughs> I, I once had the misfortune of running into Chantal during an election. I was down campaigning on Wellington Street, and Chantal accosted me. And when she was finished with me, I thought, Ooh, I really don't think I should be in this business. <laughs> you know, I, thought, yeah. she just I feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> completely. So Sorry, I'm, do go on. She's tough. She's a tough uh, cookie, but she's great. So what, what drew you to Trinity? What, what, uh, well, what, I, I had, so I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, and I had started, I did my first two years at University of Manitoba uh, for no good reason except that's where my friends are going. Yeah. Uh, and I did a couple of years there, but I got involved with the student newspaper there, and I, and I wound up uh, being the editor of it for one very intense year. Uh, and at the end of which, 
uh, it just felt kind of anticlimactic just to go back to being Joe's student again. Yeah. Uh, and so I had, a, I guess, a kind of an internal compass saying it was time to, time to move on. My, I am the youngest of five. My older brothers and sisters all went to Queens. For some reason, none of them recommended that I go to Queens. Yeah. I think they were worried I was going to ruin the family rep. <laughs> right. uh, but my sister Susie, who knew some fellows who had gone to, had gone to Trinity or were going to Trinity, um, I think had the good sense and intuition to realize it was perfect for me. So she recommended, and then I applied and came here in third year. And you, 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 you were once quoted as saying that you appreciated Trinity's culture of eccentricity. Yeah, it's, was uh, I, had a, I, I was only here for two years, but it's funny how you know, your university years are such a large time in your life. Eh? And, and uh, those two years uh, were extraordinarily formative for me. I met some of my best friends ever since then, you know, and, and some of the most interesting people. And I do think, and I suppose we all think that you know, the year we're there is the golden age kind of thing, yeah. but there were a lot of interesting people here. And there does, there does and, and did, anyway, I hope it's still the case, be ten, it was a very interesting um, culture to the place. Uh, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the silly old customs and traditions and hallowed rules and things. And my theory of it is there's three types of people who go to Trinity College, and they're defined by how they respond to these customs and traditions and rituals. It's one group that says, oh, isn't this marvelous? This is exactly... <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly the kind of faux Oxford experience I've been looking for. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> then there's a second group that says to themselves, well, this doesn't make any sense. How's, how's this going to get me a job? Or how's this going to advance social justice? And then I think there's a large group in the middle who just think it doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense. Just take it for what it is and, and, and enjoy it and have fun with it. And I think out of that or out of whatever else is in the water here, there, it just seems to be a sort of a, a, a collective kind of um, sense of humor about things mm -hmm. that I think people value about their Trinity experience. And yeah, kids who would have been outcasts anywhere else got to be stars at Trinity. Yeah. Like they just, I met some of the weirdest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> you know? And they were like head of college, you know. <laughs> uh, oh well, not head of arts, I hope. <laughs> So it, 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 I, I really value and cherish that because I think yeah. that uh, I think that's the kind of thing that stays with people for the rest of their life. You know yeah. that that, that uh, you don't have to just be a conformist and you don't just have to do things you know the way everybody else does it. And I think it's a big part of the Trinity uh, thing. More recently, uh, since the uh, Harry Potter time, the number of young students I've talked they said, well, "What attracted you to Trinity?" Well, it's sort of like Hogwarts, you know, right. is what they say. Right. So it's the same sort of thing. It's, a, it's the attraction of that. But the fact of the matter is it's still one of the most difficult places to get into on the U of T campus, which yes. is already the top campus in Canada. So now, we're not, they, we may be bizarre, yes. but... Uh, I'm sure it's all gone to hell since I was here. <laughs> I, I, but I'm uh, only consoled by... You have no idea how far it is from 55 years ago. I was going to say, graduated. I'm consoled by the thought that it had already gone to hell when, by the time I was there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So some of the traditions... and As far as I understand it, pouring out now consists of everyone agrees to meet after dinner and somebody just waves their hand over and says, you've been poured out. Uh, I, I, is everybody here from Trinity? Yeah. So, <laughs> when I, so when I was at college, pouring out was... You had, you, 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 you had violated the unwritten law somehow in a way that you were never told until afterwards uh, at, at dinner time. And so you, your presence had become so obnoxious to everyone else in the dinner, time, dinner, dinner hall that you had to leave forcibly. And so the head of second year, the second year men, as the title was then, uh, would come over. Well, what would happen is everybody at, your t at some table would start banging the table in unison saying, poor coin, out, 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 out. And the head of second year men would come over and inquire as to the nature and gravity of the offense. And if he was sufficiently, uh, thought it was sufficiently grave, as he uh, always did, <laughs> he would come and stand behind you in a very dramatic gesture with his thumbs up. And then at his signal of his thumbs plunging down, all of the second year men would come over. This was in the days of segregated male and female dining halls. Uh, all the second year men would come running over in a screaming horde and try and drag you from your, from your place. And you were allowed one person holding across the table holding your feet and one person on either side of you holding you to the table. And if you could stay at your seat for 60 seconds, you were accorded the supreme, this virtually never happened, but if you did, 
you were accorded the supreme accolade of being allowed to walk from the hall. <laughs> and otherwise, you were dragged from the hall, and either way, you missed dinner. From what I understand, maybe when you were there, Bill, uh, in the old days, uh, <laughs> I didn't say very old. <laughs> Uh, we you could older graduates than me. You, <laughs> as I understand it, you were allowed to have your entire table defend you in those days. So it was just an absolute pitched battle. So we were relatively civilized by the time I was there. Well, I, 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 it's really amazing. You know, I hadn't thought about this way, but this whole idea of getting thrown out is a perfect introduction to talk about the election. The master of the segue. I, I can think of somebody being held down in his chair and being <laughs> hugged and thrown into the election. Uh, but anyway, so let's talk about the election since, uh, since you brought it up. What did you think about the idea of a, such a long campaign? I mean, it looked as if the Tories kind of hoist themselves on their own petard. I mean, it was a plan. It looked like a good plan at the time, but it turned to backfire, don't you think? Depends when you think the campaign began, because, of course, you know, there was the official writ period, and then there was the pre-writ period, and then there was, before that, there were several months of people right. unveiling policy platforms, or yeah. policy planks, I should yeah. say. Uh, so some people would say, oh, isn't this terrible that this is all because of fixed election dates, and yeah, people what do you are, think of the that? permanent campaign leading up to the fixed election date. Well, I think they forget what it was like before we had the fixed election date, because in place of the permanent campaign, the permanent preparation of people, we had the permanent speculation about when the campaign would be. Yeah. Right? It was, you know, Mansbridge, bless his heart, that was the only thing he wanted to ask us, was when do you think the election's going to be? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I don't look back on those well, pre- Well, a bit uh, of a one-note tune. <laughs> you know, but. I don't look back on those pre-fixed uh, election date period with any, with any fondness. Um, I, I am a fan of the, what we've just gone through in many ways. I think the fact that we had these, as I say, these big important policy planks unveiled in the spring, and we spent days and weeks discussing them then and really getting our teeth into, okay, what's the liberal child care plan versus the NDP versus the Tories? I think that's good. I think if those had been, if this had been a traditional 36-day campaign or whatever, and they'd been unveiled in an afternoon and forgotten about by the next day and subsumed in the more important business of, you know, whose website didn't work properly or the, the things that we get obsessed with in, the, in our media coverage, I think it would have been most unfortunate. And uh, uh, I agree with you, Bill, that, that from a purely partisan standpoint, if the Tories thought this was going to be, be a, big, uh, a big winner for them, uh, um, it didn't prove to be the case. Right. Uh, I think one of the consequences was, uh, and this was always going to be one of the decisive aspects of the campaign, was people were going to make up their mind one way or another about Justin Trudeau. Yeah. And the fact that it was such a long campaign, and the fact that he started in third, this is a point Bruce Anderson made the other night that I think is quite profound. Um, my theory of, of the whole Justin Trudeau thing is, is I, th I think um, we tend, we the public, we the media, we tend to look at politics through a prism of story. We, we organize events around narratives. And we in the press, of course, are the worst of this, but I think it's to some extent human nature. And I think there was a section of, a large section of Canadian public opinion that was kind of looking at him through the, the sort of Prince Hal storyline, right? The, the son of, you know, yeah. the feckless youth who goes on to become king, I think. Right. And to a certain extent, people were kind of willing that storyline to be fulfilled. But it wasn't going to be unless he performed, unless he worked hard and showed that he was willing to do, do the hard work and didn't just think he was entitled to it and didn't just mm -hmm. think he could just swan in and take over. And he did, and he, I mean, we, to some extent, we reenacted that whole boxing match thing that they did a few years ago, where everyone thought he was gonna get his clock clean, and he buckled down and trained hard and, and surprised everybody, not least his opponent. Uh, so if he was Prince Hal, did, uh, did uh, Mulcair turn out to be false? I'm still working out who false. <laughs> it's not quite as much fun as false. Stuff. But I think that was, it. I mean, I think, so, so, I didn't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> Just didn't, just, he didn't drink as much as. <laughs> uh, I, 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 so I, as I say, I, obviously leaders are crucial in, in campaigns. You know that much better than I do. And, and to be frank with you, I think Harper and the Conservatives, I think their fate was pretty much sealed from the beginning. Uh, if you look at polling data going back two or three years, uh, it's been kind of locked in. They, they had so polarized the electorate. There was... You know, 30% of the public, or 25 or 30%, 
that was only ever going to go vote for the conservatives, and then there were 65 or 70 that was never going to vote for them. And so, and if you look, I was always struck by the the second place numbers. It seems to me, you know, people's second choices seem to me the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen because it's one thing, I mean, it's striking enough that only five percent of non-Tory voters would put the Tories second. That tells you that their ceiling was really at about 35 percent, which is not going to get you a government unless you know everything works out perfectly for you. But even more striking was 50 percent of conservative voters wouldn't name a second choice. Yeah, that is a miracle. Right? They, they either wanted to be governed by the Conservatives or they didn't want to have a government at all. Right. 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 Uh, and I've never seen anything like that. So I think that, you know, I, frankly, I think the Tories were just kind of hoping, you know, hoping for a miracle or hoping they could hold it to minority. The contest in this election was always going to be, can one of the Liberals of the NDP gather up that 65% or some significant portion of it, a governing majority of it, and um, uh, that is an amazing election when you see the Liberals go from 25% at the start to 40 at the end, and the NDP go from 40 at their peak, 38 anyway, to 20 at the end. Uh, that's one of the more decisive knockouts that I think I've ever seen and in what, an election what campaign. Would, I mean, NICAB obviously was an important role. I think uh, the, the deficit uh, yeah. thing. I, I was with Bill Morneau the other day. I, was, I said, when did you sense? Things changed, he said, when we announced that we were going to do the deficit. Yep. He said, the day after people were coming across the street to say, I'm going to go vote for you. Yep. So in Quebec, obviously, it might have been the kneecap. So I think there were a bunch of things. I mean, I think, I think the, the NDP uh, just fundamentally misread the situation, I think. I think they thought uh, the Liberals were just terminal. I think they thought they're, they're going to get knocked out of the ring early. Uh, Trudeau will dissolve under scrutiny. Uh, and... And uh, then it'll be a two-horse race between us and the, and the Conservatives, and all we need to do is present ourselves as a responsible government in waiting, not, not the scary NDP, but, you know, yeah. government that, that's ready, and, and, um, and, and all that uh, non-Tory vote will come to us. And it, to be fair to them, I mean, through the first several weeks of the campaign, they could be forgiven for thinking that. They peaked in the polls August the 24th. Very interesting. And August the 25th, in what I'm sure they thought was the master stroke, they announced that they would balance the budget not only in the course of their mandate, as you might expect them to say, but in each and every single year, including the first year. And I think this was going to be the thing that was going to seal the deal, show that he was ready to govern. And I imagine, I don't know this for the fact, but I imagine there was a meeting of the Liberal War Room on that day, and they said, go, we're going deficit. And they basically, they told the Toronto Star on that day, and then they formally unveiled it the next day. And that's, to me, absolutely the turning point of the campaign. Not, I think, in the substance of, you know, there was millions of Canadians out there, you know, had worked out that we needed to have Keynesian stimulus and blah, blah, blah. Right, right. I think it was that it symbolized... Well, I was hoping you were going to go there. But, uh. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll never concede. That, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think it's just, it just symbolized we're the ones who, who, if you're angry about the state of things, we're the ones who are your, your party. If you think that we need change now, not later. That kind of urgency, that kind of fire... Uh, they just seem to capture more of a sense of we're the, we're the ones who really want to get rid of this gang uh, for, for the voters who were looking for that. And then, as you say, I, I think the next thing after that is, is uh, uh, I think the NICAB certainly did some damage. There's, I understand there's some polling data out in the last sort of day that suggests that the biggest thing with the NICAB was persuading um, undecided voters in Quebec to go to the bloc at first. But there's no doubt it also did some damage to the NDP and made them more damaged than the, ND, than the Conservatives might have hoped, of course, because the NDP support went down so far that it really accelerated that push for people to, to decide, okay, I better, I better go to the Liberals, and it became the sort of self-reinforcing um, Yeah, I think loop. it was a question of the Tories killing the NDP well, for and, the Liberals. And I, I think it also hurt part. the Tories. It's very yeah. interesting. So the Tories, the Tory support bottomed out in early September. They had that terrible few weeks, of course, with the Duffy trial. Uh, and and they were running a no, terrible. It was a wonderful week. What are you talking about? <laughs> from their <laughs> what was terrible about that? From their I mean, perspective. That from their perspective. <laughs> uh, and they were not running a very good campaign. There was infighting, etc. And they bottomed out in early September. And then they got a lift out of that weird the Syrian refugee thing, where it all exploded because of that poor little boy's picture on the paper. And and they were rising, and they rose all the way through September. And then you see their support peak and fall off starting October second. What happened on October second? I would call it peak niqab. 
they'd, been, they'd been building this all through the week. It was leading up to the second French debate, so they wanted to get as much focus on this as possible. And then on October 2nd, they unveiled the uh, Barbaric Practices Snitch Line. Yeah. And uh, I just think, I think a lot of people at that point went, enough. That's, that's just too much. That's, you guys have lost the plot. And a guy like Chris Alexander. No, oh, just, you explain oh, it's that? a very, very sad story of what, what's happened to his career generally. Yeah. But I think it hurt them that way. <laughs> I'm being nice. Uh, so I think it hurt them that way, the Tories. It hurt them for the reason we've discussed with the NDP. It also reminded people uh, who were ill disposed to government why they disliked them so much. If, again, if you look at some of the numbers mid campaign when the Tories were doing well, they were starting to, you were starting to see some softening. You were starting to see more people putting them as their second choice. You were starting to see Harper's numbers improving a bit. He, he was very good through the debates. He was very, he, didn't, he was unflappable. He didn't take, uh, didn't, didn't flash any anger. He was very, he's very good at explaining himself when he chooses to. Yeah. Uh, and he actually, I actually think he did, I think he did quite well in debates and people were, you know, at, at the margin, people were starting to soften on him. And then you bring this out and they, people go, oh. That's, yeah, and, the, and the, the danger yeah. for the Tories was, you know, if people weren't feeling the Tories were a, you know, a clear and present danger that had to be got with now, then they could say, okay, I'm going to vote for the NDP because that's my party. Yeah. The minute they say, it's an emergency, I have to get rid of the Tories, which of these parties, the Liberals? I'm going for the Liberals. So it hurt them that way. And the last thing I'd say on that is, the last gasp the Tories had was the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which was a big achievement. I think they deserve enormous credit for it, from my perspective anyway. And was, uh, unlike most of their camp campaign, was something new. Uh, I mean, most of their campaign was more of the same, only more like it. Uh, this was actually a big achievement, and it could have been a good news story, you know, we're working hard to, for your prosperity, and just as, you know, they got about a day of that, and then they go back to the kneecap, and, and, and so you just completely lose whatever gain they might have had from that. So that's pr probably more than you want to hear on that, but that's... No, the, no, I think it's very, it, it, I think there's so many different strains there. Uh, when, when, you know, when you start it off, Obviously, Tom Mulcair had been a much better performer in the House of Commons than Justin. There was no question about that. Yeah. But I was watching a little bit how Justin was traveling across the country, and he, he would go, he'd go to a campus or go somewhere, yeah. and there'd be 500 people or 1,000 people, and he was doing that day after day after day, not being in the House of Commons. The press was sort of saying, oh, Mulcair is wonderful, Justin's... A Meanwhile, he was out actually, I think, building an enormous constituency that no, nobody really even knew about. It was almost subterranean. That's a fair that. point. Now, I hate to give anybody demerit points for being in Parliament and doing the people's work in Parliament. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so uh, you're, it's a fair yeah. point, but... Yeah, but having uh, been opposition leader, I can appreciate I uh, understood. <laughs> I got nothing but demerit points from the <laughs> press. But, <laughs> but I, it's a fair point. And certainly, I, I just think I would say that... that, that we saw the limitations of Mulcair as a, in terms of his ability to appeal, appeal to the public in this campaign. And we saw, obviously, Trudeau's strengths. I tweeted something in last spring, a photo, uh, no, video the, of Justin Trudeau at the Gay Pride Parade, which is neither here nor there, except it was a large gathering of people. And he was bounding down the street and running from one side to the next, you know, hugging people. And I'm looking at this going, I tweeted was it's going to be a different kind of campaign. You couldn't imagine Stephen yeah. Harper or Tom Mulcair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, it's just they're just not who they are, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, you could imagine Jack Layton yeah. in a slightly yeah, yeah. more restrained Jack way. Jack did it, yeah. For sure. But but and it's odd how many people go into politics and get to rise to very senior levels of it who aren't really comfortable around other people. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Which is odd to me, because you'd think, if you were asking yourself, do I want to go into politics, you'd think the first question you would ask yourself is, do I like being around people? Yeah. You know, if you're going to be an astronaut, do, am I afraid of heights? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, know, Michael Ignatieff was not terribly keen on working a crowd. And, and no, very and very uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. and, 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 and Trudeau, I mean, it's that, and of course it's also... Uh, the storyline, it's, it's, you know, he, he's, I, I want to give him absolute credit. He has worked for everything he's got here, but, but you, you just cannot pretend that the issue of him being the son of Pierre is not going to be somewhere in people's reading of it. And, of course, the early line on him was, you know, oh, he's his mother's son, not his father's son. Uh, I think we learned over time there was a bit more of his father in them uh, yeah. than we'd realized. And his father was, as you would know better than I, was a, was a puzzle and enigma. I mean, if anybody should have been just a sort of pampered, 
yeah. fragile flower with the kind of upbringing he had. You'd think he would, and yet every story ever told about him is yeah, you know, what an intense he, guy, he how, tough, how yeah. tough he was, how yeah. physically courageous he was. Yeah. And, and certainly Justin seems to have inherited some of his self-discipline and, and, and work ethic. And in the campaigning, I remember campaigning with him in Papineau in the election, I guess was 2005 or whatever, you know, going back then. And it was amazing. We'd go into a store yeah. and people would come crawling in and people would be hugging him and grabbing him yeah. on the street. It was, it, was, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was a total phenomenon. And Bob Ray and I were sort of standing there looking and saying, whoa, nobody does this to us. I mean, you know, I'm just, it's just totally amazing. Now, I, I was one of those who was skeptical of Justin in the early going uh, and for some time after. And, and I would still say, uh, uh, I, I don't think we would call him a philosopher king. Uh, no. um, um, but he's, but he's shown, got Jerry Butts. <laughs> that's, well, that's right. And he's certainly shown raw political talent. He's shown, I think, good instincts, good uh, yeah. a willingness to take risks. I mean, part of this campaign was he, he just kept wrong-footing the NDP. The dis yeah. deficit was one of them, but the F-35 and things. And I don't necessarily subscribe to any of his choices in policy terms, but I will absolutely give him points in terms of, of how he was able to position the party, obviously with advice and judgment from his, from his advisors, but, but, uh, but obviously it's the person at the top. Who they spent a lot calls. of time recruiting candidates, too. They did. They, Andrew, I mean, when you yeah. get people like Bill Blair and Andy, you yeah. know, Andy, I mean, these are, don't really, I mean, he, they got out, I mean, to, I know some people, they said to me, come and help these people. We want to get them in. Yeah. This, was, this was thought about years ago. It wasn't thought about yesterday. And this that is one of, that's serious what, plan. And that is one of the critiques you can make of Stephen Harper's leadership of the Conservatives, that they never did much, seems, much effort into recruiting uh, you know, really strong candidates. His cabinet was notoriously thin. Um, he just seemed unable to reach out or to, or to try to bring on board people. Uh, who were strong in their own right? You could count on sort of one hand the, the significant cabinet ministers in that in that cabinet, and that this final strange uh, campaign where he's just all by himself in the ads. He's all by himself on the campaign. You know, did you see a can another cabinet minister in the campaign once or twice? I think they brought out John Baird, who's not even in cabinet anymore. Yeah, uh, it was uh, yeah. it was an eerie, strange. Twilight campaign of the Tories. I, I'd love to know what was going on in the, behind the scenes. Well, there's definitely was a gooder Dameron sort of a little aspect. Bit. It's a weird <laughs> yeah, kind of feeling of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, to, to, about just before we leave the campaign, the press. Yeah. I mean, you know, my son Patrick. He, I know, do. He, Patrick's written, and he's like a journalist like you. And he sort of he phoned me the other day. He said, you know. That crazy Globe and Mail editorial, <laughs> the what you, your position was with the Post, and the, so he said, okay, as you say, owners they've got a right to to do what they do. That's fine, but his view was that if that's the way the press is going to be governed and people perceive it that way, mm. it's going to lose its credibility. People, I mean, with so many other access to social media, already the press is going down like this in terms of comp competition from other social media. If people think it's just being run by a bunch of people, particularly the National Post group, who are who, and Paul Godfrey's taking strings from a group of, of uh, financial people in, in in New York, I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, is is this a serious problem or not a serious problem? Well, it's an, it's an interesting problem, isn't it? Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have a personal? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say off the top, having written some strange, tortured editorials in my time. I uh, have sympathy with any editorial writer uh, at any time, let alone election time. I yeah, wrote. But Walmsley must have turned himself into a pretzel. Well, a little bit. One. But I, I, wrote a, I wrote an even worse one in uh, 1993. And in my defense, uh, when I was writing editorials for the Globe at that time, in my defense, that was a weird election. Uh, um, so the Conservatives, had ascent, who we would probably instinctively support, had just completely collapsed. They, they, you know, everyone knew they were going down in flames. They they had completely lost their will to live, and and uh, you couldn't really endorse them. The liberals, forgive me, had just run a campaign that we couldn't possibly endorse. The, at that time, Gretchen was saying deficit schmefficit. You know, it'll all fix itself, and and we, we really couldn't uh, couldn't sign on to that. And the Reform Party, who some of whose platform we liked, weren't even running in Quebec, so they couldn't form a government. So you know, who do you endorse in that situation? So I wound up writing an editorial that wound up. Was endorsing the, all of them and not endorsing any of them, and you know. Was this the Globe or the? Yeah, it was at the Globe at the time. Yeah. So you know, sometimes you're just in a bad situation. Um, I think it is. 
I, I, I'm a believer in unsigned editorials. Let's start, start with that point. Some people don't think there's any point to them, and you know, we should just have signed columnists. And I think there's a difference uh, when the newspaper is putting its voice behind things. I think people read it a different way. They tend to be more cautious, uh, and therefore, when they, when they shift a few points, it has it more registered than if some wacko columnist changes his mind. Um, and I, I just think there's a place on the spectrum for you know, not only columnists, but also editorials. And I, I think there's some value in endorsements as well. I'm not under any illusion that they have a huge impact on people's votes, except possibly negative. Um, but, but they're part of the mix, and, and there may be some voter somewhere who's just hoping, to, trying to figure it out, and this may, can, can maybe clarify the choices. So I don't think there's anything wrong with them in principle, and I absolutely uh, would, would fight to the death for the idea that they, that they are the prerogative of the owner. I don't think the journalists have any business telling the owners what they, you know, how to run their paper. But, to take your point, um, if they're smart, the owners will use it judiciously and yeah. will do so in a way that, that doesn't, uh, doesn't come across as, as, uh, as, as non-credible or, or as, if, as if it was just in, in defiance of the facts. So every paper, I think, every owner has to be uh, um, judicious about using that thing in a way that, that, that won't uh, put people's backs up. Um, and uh, um, I remember not all of them always are. Oh, I remember being interviewed. Well, I remember I had to go to editorial boards to defend my position on a lot of things when I was leader of the opposition. And I, I don't know, it may have been, uh, it may have been uh, the war in Lebanon or something. And I'd, I'd been beaten up pretty badly going across the country at the various national posts. Uh, and I got to Montreal, the Gazette. And I had a totally different conversation with them. I said, what's the matter with you guys? I mean, aren't you owned by the same people? Oh, they said, if we had those views, we wouldn't sell any papers in Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you know, you've got to moderate a little bit about... And I should say, for the most part, in my experience, uh, having been an a, a editorial page editor, um, uh, most of the time, you, you weren't dealing with them at all. And, um, and I thought I found it an interesting job in that respect because I had this sort of dual role of, do, of doing that and also writing a column. And I knew that the, the editorials couldn't just be Andrew Coyne carbon copy. There, had, there was a reason for them. And I saw my role as being finding the, the right weight and the right synthesis between the views of the owners, the views of my editor, the views of the people writing the editorials for me, the views of our readers. And it was some kind of mixture of them, and it might vary from subject to subject, but that that had a purpose to it of, of sort of knitting those, ide those, those things together in some common form struck me as an interesting, um, an interesting challenge and a useful uh, part of the paper. Um, but that, that it's, it's best if that balancing act is maintained. Yeah, it's a balancing act, as yeah. you say, like everything in life. What about balancing in terms of the Conservative Party? I mean, you, the Harper legacy, we don't need to dwell too much on it, but uh, I was very impressed by that article in the New York Times, the closing of the Canadian mind. I mean, mm. when, the, when Marsh sort of said that it's, Harper's policy been more negligible, more irritating distractions than substantial changes. Yes. And I'd honestly say that I think that was reflected in your columns. I, I respect you as a conservative voice, and if I can put words in your mouth, I mm -hmm. honestly think that as a, as a, a real conservative, you were disappointed well, I, that I have, in, in the nature of the policies that were adopted. I have to stop you there, Bill. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, if people, people, the liberals think I'm a conservative, and conservatives think I'm a liberal. Uh, uh, I describe well, myself. Well, you're a very conflicted personality. I know. I, <laughs> it's a it's a balance. It's a synthesis. So I, when asked, I describe myself as a as a liberal, conservative, libertarian, socialist. <laughs> and I mean every word, because in my opinion, each each of the traditions has something to teach us. You know, I mean, if a conservative is somebody who thinks we should preserve institutions that have value, well, I think we should preserve institutions that have value. And if a liberal is somebody who thinks we need to reform institutions that are in need of, well, I think we should reform the ones that are in need of reform. And, you know, if a libertarian says we should respect the rights of the individuals in the matters that are, you know, to the, well, yeah, I believe that. And if a socialist thinks we should look after people who are less, well, yeah, we should all do. So why do we need to say I'm only one thing or the other? I've right. never quite understood. I know people like to wow. pigeonhole you yeah. like to pigeonhole me, but I, yeah. I just... Well, if you have to run for office at some point, get pigeonholed. Try not to pigeonhole myself. Yeah, yeah. well, fair enough. Anyway, um, uh, I, think the, I think that it's absolutely right. I, the, the, there are some critics on the left whose, whose beef with Harper is 
He's fundamentally transformed Canada. And there are some conservatives who are fervent supporters of Harper who think he has fundamentally transformed Canada. I, I just don't see it. No. I think it's been a lot of small ball. I think they, they, um, the lesson that they learned from their defeats, wrongly I think, was that they couldn't make a case uh, for the kinds of policies and principles that they believed in. So rather than just folding up their tent and finding another line of work, uh, they decided they would just change their principles. Uh, I find that baffling about politics. That, that seems to me that you're in the persuasion business if you're in politics. If you believe that the policies that you're espousing are the right ones for the country, then you should find a way to sell them. And if you don't sell them right the first time, try, try again. Right. The NDP, God bless them, uh, didn't, you know, with the, they didn't get Medicare brought in the first time they ran. They didn't go, well, then I guess we're going to be in favor of something else, right? Yeah. Um, and con the Conservatives, uh, you'll like hearing this, Bill. Conserv the Conservative Party of Canada, I think, is a very damaged psyche to that collective group. You know how some sports teams, they, they, they've got all the talent and they just don't seem to have the good s collective psyche? Yeah. I think the Conservatives have lost so many elections over the decades that it's just damaged them. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so they have all these kind of built-in resentments and grievances, some of which are perfectly justified. I don't doubt there's a section of the media that's out to get them, and some of the bureaucracy wants to get them, and all these things. But if you go in there wearing that idea you know, on your sleeve, and just everything you do sim signals the idea that you think everyone's out to get you, then you're going to reap what you sow. Yeah. So they needed to get over that, and the, and the leader's job is to get over that. And, and part and parcel of that, as I say, was this idea that, well, okay, we can't actually lay out what we believe and what we would like to do if an office. So we'll just kind of try and sneak it in, or we'll just do these little micro policies, and we'll just try and sustain ourselves in power without actually doing anything. And in the end, of course, they get tossed out in the ear, their ear after only four years with a majority. And I'll remind people again, it is rare in this country for majority governments to get defeated. We don't actually tend to do that in this country. We're pretty cautious. We, we stick with the devil we know. It usually only happens when there's some terrible economic situation. So 93, uh, 84, yeah. uh, and 1935, of course. And the other one's 1957, when, forgive me, Bill, the liberals had been in power so yeah. long that yeah. people were just hardly sick of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we, we don't- Not Louis Saint Laurent, please. Uh, even <laughs> beloved old <laughs> Uncle Louis. So, you know, it, it's an achievement of sorts to have, have, you know, we all thought in 2011 that maybe we were on the brink of some kind of, uh, of realignment here. He, Harper had been able to put together this coalition of the West and Ontario, which we'd never seen in quite that mix before, and it looked like a coalition that was built to last, and then they throw it away in four years, mostly just by annoying people to death. Yeah. You know, just, just being so petty and so vindictive and so controlling and so suspicious and paranoid and deceptive and it's just these, all these kind of atmospheric things, I think more than anything else, that uh, brought them into such odium and it was mm -hmm. all self-inflicted and unnecessary. They didn't yeah. have to do any of that. And on the other hand, I think from a liberal perspective, I mean, you know, in Canada we elected liberals. No, but, I mean, I've watched this. I watched in Europe the Liberal parties gradually be eliminated. I remember sitting beside yeah. Vic, Victor Orban, one time was a member of Liberal International, and he left. And I said to him, Victor, where are you going? What, what's going on? He said, there's no room in the middle of the road. I'm going over to the right. Yeah. And you saw what happened in the UK and the Liberal Party. So there was some feeling in the Liberal Party in Canada as well. Absolutely. You know, is liberalism, is that center of the road? Yeah, are we able to, to hold that, or, or are we now moving, as in the United States, in a, in a world where it is polar opposites that fight to the death at every yeah. time, and one gets on top of the other, the way BC politics always was when I was growing up. You know, social credit would win, That's right. then the NDP would win, and we'd get these violent switches back and forth. There was but, certainly a real danger of that, wasn't there, in, yeah. after 2011, and, and people like me were writing pieces saying, oh, it doesn't look good for the Liberals, and what I thought they had to do, which they, you know, by some miracle, did not follow my advice. Was I thought well, they maybe needed? They were suspicious of that. That's just, well, what, I, what I thought they needed to do, and what I hoped they would do, and I, what I suppose I still would like to see this, is kind of reinvent the middle. That, it, yeah. that instead of sort of being sort of half measures of each and just sort of the mushy middle, uh, be, take some sort of bold stands on that. Some of which might be left, some of which might be right, but that, that fit together in a coherent way. Because oftentimes they do. I, the, yeah. Part of the problem with right and left is. They don't actually make sense as bundles of policies. There's right. a lot of internal contradictions in them, and you could put together a much more 
coherent thing that, 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 could, that could justify your existence in the, in the middle. And I was, at the time, disappointed because instead what the party said is, let's get Justin Trudeau. Uh, you know, let's get a big name yeah. and let's spare ourselves having to go through that, that agonizing reappraisal. Uh, and I think for a lot of liberals, it, that they just thought this is our life raft. And people like me said, oh, this is suicide. That, you know, what's he going to ever do? And we were all proven wrong. So, um, uh, and to be fair to him, if you look at some of the policies that he's unveiled, uh, there's a little bit of that. It's, it's, it's too simple to say that they tacked left of the NDP. Yeah. I think they tacked outside the NDP. Uh, that's a good uh, There were yeah. some things that were, you know, some of his policies on pipelines, for example, that is the right of the, the NDP on foreign investment. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think he's going to be a, con, you know, purely conventional, you know, left wing, old left type of idea politician, but there were certainly some other things where they did go to the left of the NDP. On the Justin thing, though, of, you know, the party going to Justin, I'll tell you, I, I was a little skeptical at the beginning. And I went down, they asked me if I'd go down, it was in Toronto, it was on a Saturday morning, go down and speak to a bunch of people that were running in his campaign. I walked into a basement room, and there were 250. Yeah. Young people that I don't think had ever voted in their lives before, and they were so pumped. That campaign, I thought, holy crow, this is a phenomenon. This uh, absolutely. This, and, is and not, this is not, you know, let's grab this popular guy. I mean, he created sure. this absolutely extraordinary movement that took over the party. No, it very true. And, and, and people like me can sometimes, you know, <laughs> lose sight of the fact, you know, it's not all about programs and policies. It's ultimately about people, and then people have a visceral attachment to somebody or, or they don't. Um, I was on the TV the other night, of course, during the um, election thing, and we had on Bob Ray as, as, as yeah, a guest, Bob was there, who yeah. I love. And, and yeah. Bob Ray is one of the great you know, gentlemen of, of, of Canadian politics. And one of the brightest guys. Absolutely. I'm a bright. huge fan. But there was, <laughs> there was a great moment, though, where, where Bob, his, his, his version of the history of the last few years, as he put it, was, uh, I, I, I made way for, for Trudeau, or I, I opened the way <laughs> for Trudeau. That's right. I opened the way for Bob because yeah. I moved down so he could get my seat. So, you know. Somebody not, always has to move over for somebody. I'm just you not know. entirely sure that that was Bob's choice. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Well, you know, if you get you, moved, I maybe you you're better saw, to say you moved yourself. I think yourself. you saw that phenomenon coming, and, and as you say, that, that, was, that, looked, that was a way that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't yeah. fight. So where's that... Where, where's that leave the Conservative Party now? I mean, will so do they retreat to that kind of reform thing? Because you, you mentioned about the bitterness. There was a dimension of that. I remember the first time I ever had lunch in the House of Commons, actually, it was Jeb Baldwin and Mr. Stanfield took me to lunch mm -hmm. there years ago. They were trying to recruit me to do something. And they were, you know, very gentlemanly and everything else. And then when I was in the House of Commons myself, the reform people came in, and they were also bitter and... Yeah, the things don't matter, and this is a terrible place, and yeah. everybody's evil, and there was that whole sort of atmosphere that was really no, it was really no, it I was understand. quite un, was was unpleasant. It you, was, you, you may have I seen Kathy nodding her head, but I mean, you may even, have seen you know, that the worst. in the spouses group, so there was it was unpleasant. Everybody said, you know, so so there was that kind of bitterness. Do you think the party risks retreating into that kind of bitter retreat mood, mode, or do you think they'll say? Well, maybe we need to get back that other dimension, the, the McKay's, the Well, I, in, the a, way I, I in mean, a way, I think they need to do, I, either, I'm trying to debate whether I want to say both or neither of those things. Um, well, that'd be, that would fit with your iconoclistic right. sort of uh, <laughs> well, view. Let, yeah, well, let me explain. Uh, in a, in a, in, in, I suppose the good news as far as the Tories are concerned is by the end of his time there, I think Harper and his people didn't really represent anybody in the party. I, I, I don't think you could say that they had really um, done much for the social conservatives. They basically put them under a gag, right? right. Um, I don't think the fiscal conservatives could be too happy with them. A little bit more laterally, but these, they added $150 billion to the debt, and, and I don't think fiscal conservatives, and plus, you know, throwing subsidies at every corporation under the sun. So I don't think the fiscal and economic conservatives can be too right. happy with them. I certainly don't think the reformers who you, you, you can cast it as that uh, negative thing, and I'm sure it was for, for many of them, but there was a more positive aspect of they wanted to bring more accountability uh, to Parliament and to make leaders and governments more accountable to the Parliament and to the people. And at its best, I think that yeah. was very admirable. They certainly can't be happy with the kind of total central control of Harper. So, Absolutely not. Uh, so while it's true that having lost the guy who built the party, 
that there's a danger that they could split off. I think the fact that by the end of his term, he was, I think the Harper loyalists was a pretty narrow circle may be helpful to them in terms of keeping it together. Um, I do think, I, my own interpretation of what went on over the last few years is, I think what we saw, and to tie back to that we were just discussing before about the small ball and not really doing much in the policy thing, I think the reason, in my view, is politics fills a vacuum. If you're not going to have serious and substantive differences with your opponents, if you're not going to have a, a real program of government that you're going to contrast with them, then you're going to substitute mindless partisanship in its place. So because they didn't have a, a you know, philosophical argument to, to, to lay out and, and, and talk, you know, spend their time talking about that, then they st instead they'd started you know, hurling insults and all the things that unfortunately they became known for. Um, uh, so what I hope they will do is invert that. Substantive differences, a, 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 you know, a serious large C, small C conservative vision of how they would, mm -hmm. they would govern, but put it across in civil, you know, genial terms. And, and, and there's no reason it can't be. There's no reason conservatism has to be this kind of scowling, nasty thing. Yeah. If it, at its best, it's, I think, a very positive and generous idea that, that we want to, you know, we want to uh, empower individuals, we wanna, we, you know, to, 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 we, well, we want to insist upon personal responsibility and individual initiative, but we also want to help people who need it, but in a way that respects their choices and creates a, opportunities for them rather than trapping them in dependency. There's a, you can make that a very good-hearted, generous, positive, optimistic vision, uh, but you need somebody who actually thinks that way and speaks right. that way. And right. so, that's what I hope comes out of this. I, I don't want them to turn into a mushy party that doesn't believe in anything. They're already much too yeah. like that already. Yeah, I, I want them to have a clear vision, but I want them to, you know, treat their opponents respectfully yeah. and treat the public like adults and behave like adults themselves. Yeah. I think we, a couple of years ago, actually, I had Joe Clark here a uh, conversation, and you know, when we, he made a very interesting point. He he said that in his view, the parties had lost their national role of being a glue of bringing the country together. Because the parties, you know, the old conventions, you came together, you brought yes. people from Quebec, the Maritimes, British Columbia, they're all liberals, they traveled, they spent a week together, yeah. they, they argued about things, and you got a leader. You know, the whole process was one which they were nation-building institutions. All the three parties, the three major parties. Yeah. said so they don't do that anymore because of the nature of the way in which the leader's elected and the whole... Do you think that's true? Do you think, do you think that's an inhibiting factor in well, enabling the party to rebuild the way you're talking about? There's a lot of different cross currents there. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, if, if, it, if you're talking about how we choose the leader, uh, I would, I'm a Westminster person. I, want, I think we need to go back to, I'm a, I'm a Michael Chong Reform Act person. Yeah. I think we need to go back to having the caucus choose the leader. All right. I would involve the grassroots in lots of other ways. I would involve them in policy formation. I would involve them, I would make the local candidate much more accountable to his riding association and those kinds of things. But I think the job of the leader is to lead the caucus in parliament. If you think parliament matters, if you think members of parliament matter, then that's a big deal. And certainly a large part of the decline of the MP, in my opinion, uh, over the years has been that we that we went when when we made the, the we the leader is no longer accountable to the caucus Absolutely. Who is he accountable to? I mean Justin Trudeau wasn't even it wasn't even elected by the party membership at large He was in, in, voted by anybody who happened to be strolling by yeah, and that's and that's no, no, a that's, absolutely true. that's an electoral college that vanishes the second the vote is held yeah. so from then on he's basically accountable to nobody in my vision of democracy is you should be accountable every day yeah. Uh, you should be accountable as prime yeah. minister to parliament. You should yeah. be accountable as your leader. The way Margaret Thatcher was the well, or, 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 yeah. or exactly, yeah. Mar exactly. Margaret Thatcher, who was you know one of the great powerful figures in British politics, uh, when she, when she got offside with the party, was gone on a weekend. Yeah. And I think that teaches leaders yeah. respect for yeah. the, the caucus. Yeah. Point one. Point two, though, I think we can take some optimism out of this election in that regard, uh, uh, for whatever reason, but. Not only so. The, first of all, let's look at the good news from a national unity perspective, uh, and, and from a liberal perspective. Yeah. But first of all, the liberals uh, carried Quebec for the first time since 1980. So if you're a liberal, you got to be happy. If you're a federalist, you got to be happy that 80 percent of the vote uh, went to federalist parties in Quebec. Yes. The Bloc, they they increased their seat count, but it's a bit misleading. Their vote went down, popular vote went down, and what I think is really telling is if you look at the first plus second place. 
last election, which was a disaster for them, they had, I think, four, they got four seats, but they had, I'm going to say, 48 second places. So, so they still had a swath of Quebec where they were a factor. This time around, uh, 10 seats and 11 seconds. So they're down now to 21 seats out of 78 where they're, you know, any kind of force. That's very good news, obviously, from a federalist perspective. The liberals did their traditional um, terrible in the West, uh, but, but better than they usually do. Yeah. And in fact, they carried yeah. BC. We got Alberta, we got a seat in every single province. Absolutely, which is, which is great news for the country. I'll just, but I'll just, just to needle Bill a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it, it is one of the most amazing constants of Canadian politics is the inability of the Liberals to win in the West, or if you want to flip around, the conservative dominance of the West, which now goes back to 1949, was the last <laughs> time the Liberals carried the West. So they still got some work to do, but, but uh, uh, nevertheless, as you say, carried BC, seats in every province, swept Atlantic Canada. I consider the West, everything west of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> well, the gosh, promise is nodding. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what your problem is in the prairies there. <laughs> Ralph Goodale. <laughs> uh, um, flip that around. The Tories, while they were beaten this election, uh, have obviously held on to a, number, a large number of seats in the West, still have a majority of the seats in the West, still got, whatever it was, 30 seats in Ontario, still got 10 seats in Quebec, which was up from last time. So while there, we were talking on Monday night about, you know, is this back to the 1980s, yes, but not nearly as stark. In those days, for those of you who are too young to remember, uh, the Liberals had two seats west of Ontario, the right. Tories had one seat in Quebec. Yeah. It was, re you know, the, and half the Liberal caucus was from Quebec, which is one province. This is a much better, right. much broader base for both of those parties, and that, right. I think, is good for the country. So, speaking of that, I remember one of the longest conversations I had with Mr. Trudeau, senior, was in Winnipeg, one of the parties, and I got talking to him about proportional representation. Yeah. And the point I made to him was, was, if we had proportional representation, the Tories would have had more seats in Quebec, and we would have had more seats in the West, and it would have been better for the country. Now, he had a... He was totally against proportional representation for other reasons. Actually, yep. for democratic reasons, he said, it, he said the prime minister is already a dictator in this country, and if I'm, as the prime minister, have a right to choose the, where people stand on the lists, at that point it makes total. So, but you can you can fix that. But yeah. But but so but as well, a, that's an intro to a question I wanted yeah. to ask you. Do you think it's time for a reform of the institutional structure of our elections in the first past the post? And yes, is absolutely. There, is there any possibility it'll ever happen? I mean, well, it, more so, I think, than any time I can recall. Uh, I'm, I mean, I think the, the, the things that need reforming in our democracy, I could spend a week with you. But I think changing the electoral system is certainly uh, one important aspect of it. And particularly, to take your first point, in a country like Canada, where we already have regional divisions enough, and where our electoral system exacerbates them and makes them worse, you know, when, when yeah, because even when the Tories were getting one or two seats in Quebec, they were getting 20% of the vote. When the Liberals were getting two seats in the West, they were getting 20% of the vote. So we were giving this false and distorted picture that was damaging to the unity of the country. So the regional, the, the way that first past the post rewards regional parties, I'll give you the classic example, of course, is 1993, the Tories got 16%, got two seats. The Reform got 17 or 18% of the vote, got 53 seats. The Bloc got 19% of the vote, got 54 seats. I'm, I'm, those may mm -hmm. not be exact numbers, but you know, on that scale. So, you know, th yeah, the Tories had a terrible election, but it, the electoral system made it look worse than it was. Because why? Because they were a party with broad but thin support, and whereas parties that could really say our region before all uh, could, could do much better. So, for that reason alone, I would, I would favor change in the electoral system. But I think, and, and of course, the distortions in terms of, of if you're a Green Party supporter where they're pulling in 500,000, 600, 800,000 yeah. votes and getting zero seats, you've got to be pretty aggrieved. If you vote uh, in any riding that's a safe riding, um, it's almost pointless going to the polls, even whether you're voting for the, you know, the winning party or the losing party. More broadly, and this is a tough sell, because we've, for a lot of people, because we've grown up in this idea, and we, we have built in this idea that you only get representation in Parliament if, you, if, if your party wins, if you vote for the winning party in your riding. And people, it's hard to move people off that idea. And what I say to them is, you know, the majority should, gets to rule, yeah, but, but everybody deserves representation. Right. Is, is the point of, is the reason we elect a Parliament just to find out who won, 
or is it to represent the people in Parliament? And right. in, if you think the latter thing, then you say, well, it, doesn't, it shouldn't just be the winners who get reserve, represented in Parliament. We should have a, 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 a representation of the broad you know, spectrum of opinion in the country in the Parliament. And especially if you think we elect MPs, we elect a Parliament, we don't elect a government, which is the fact of our system, then I think, and if you, again, if you think MPs should matter, and if MPs are the people we send to mediate with each other and to negotiate with each other and to form uh, a consensus around issues, then I think you're going to be more drawn to a, to a proportional system. Yeah, if it I absolutely mean, doesn't have to be one where it's all just appointed yeah, by the leaders. No, yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. But I must say, Andrew, going back to your point, I think the press exacerbate that problem. Of course. I was always described as the liberal member of parliament for, for Toronto Centre or for Rosedale. Right. And I always said I was the member of parliament. Fair enough. And I acted as the member of parliament. And somebody came into my office for a problem. I never said, did you vote liberal or what you right. did? I was their representative. I was there to do a job for them. I never thought of yeah, myself fair, fair. as. But the press always said the liberal, the conservative. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the press. So they kind of it's create the least of our these sins. categories. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, well, no, and let no, me make, no, let me make that, one. It's kind of an, un, I thought it was an unfortunate thing because Fair I think point. once a parliament's formed, then you want to say these are the people. But tell me, uh, on, on the- Sorry, can I just make one more point on, yeah. the, on the proportional resolution? Yeah. If you're not going to move on? No, I was going to ask you no. about the French system. Do you, do you ever thought about you know the second vote? I kind of like the second vote idea. I mean, kind of at least it makes sure that everybody's got more than 50%. So I'll, I'll come to that in one second. But let, let me just say one last thing on proportional resolution. PR nerds like me get too wrapped up in the, that, all those representation questions. But I think the other aspect of it is, of, of, of the, the folly of first past the post is, is the way it, it's not just what happens on election day, it's what happens every day in between. The system of incentives, of, of rewards and penalties of the first past the post, I think rewards a lot of the worst aspects of the of politics, of the things that we, we roll our eyes most about. And the reason I say that is, it's such a highly leveraged system. What I mean by that is, a 2% swing in the popular vote leads to a 60 sweet seat swing in yeah, the parliamentary vote. So everyone's kind of on this knife edge. And how does that affect people's behavior? Well, one thing, it makes them very risk averse for long stretches of time. Mm -hmm. uh, that they, 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 so you get this long period where nobody's taking any positions at all kind of the stasis. And then we get into the election campaign and you know, people throw out the wedge issues suddenly and, and sort of try and, because why? Because they're all focusing on those two or three percent swing vote. Uh, the least informed voters in the country, the people who are making up their minds at the checkout counter. Uh, and, 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 and so people talk about, well, you know, proportional representation would, give all power to a small sliver of groups. That's what happens now. Uh, or people say, you know, we, we, if you had proportional representation, we'd have permanent minority governments. We have permanent minority governments now. We just don't call them that, yeah. right? We have governments that are elected with 37%. We call them majorities, but they're not. Yeah. So I always say proportional representation would bring in the age of, of, of major, true majority governments. And as I say, it would, it, I think it would change your behavior. If, it, what happens now is everyone's betting the farm. Everyone's hoping if I can just get that bump up in the polls, then I win everything. I win all the marbles. If you knew you couldn't do that, if you knew that you're just going to increase your, if your vote goes up 2%, your seats go up 2%, I think you'd pay more attention to sort of building your support over time mm -hmm. uh, rather than these kind of desperation Hail Mary passes that are our politics. That's interesting. On your thing, on, on the, the, uh, the, ele the actual electoral system. So the, the, the French system makes sure that you get Whoever gets there at least has got more than 50% of the vote. That's right. Vote, and know, the so. liberals have essentially, Justin Trudeau has essentially um, supported in the past a version of that, basically the, 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 the ranked ballot, which is sometimes right. called instant runoff voting. So right. rather than having two votes, as in France, right. you just put it all, you just mark one, two, three on your ballot. Yeah. Uh, that's what that's, the Irish do, isn't it? I mean, they, well, the Irish go one further. You're getting me into nerd territory here. Yeah. But the, no, no, this is The great. Irish system is like just that. trying it, to get you there. The Irish <laughs> system, and this. The system that in BC, they, on the first referendum they got 58% in support of is the single transferable vote, which is basically the ranked ballot plus multi-member ridings. And, the way, and, and it's very simple for the voter. You just mark your ballot, one, two, three. The, the counting is complicated, but the long and the short of it is, it, let's say you have a five-member riding. If your party gets 20% of the vote, you get one of those five. If you get 40% of the vote, you get two of the five. So it's bringing kind of proportionality into the, to the, to the riding level. But you don't have to have the multi-member riding. If you just have the, the ranked ballot, you don't get proportionality, but you do get, as you're saying, uh, when you add up the first and second and third choices, you'll get 
um, uh, majorities in every riding. More importantly, again, from a behavioral standpoint is, if you need to get people seconds and third choices, then you're not going to be as nasty about the other party and its supporters, Absolutely. are you? It's going to in introduce a bit more, I think, the incentive civility. system is for more civility. It has the happy coincidence, if you're a liberal, that it probably tends to favor centrist parties, which I'm just guessing I may have something to do with liberal support of it. <laughs> but to be it's fair to them, extraordinary thought. I know I can't. But. but to be fair to them, they have in the platform said they would they would have an open examination of all the different alternatives. The NDP will be pushing hard for proportional representation, possibly because the NDP would do better under it than under another system. But I hope we'll have a good national debate about it. And the other mm -hmm. thing, the last thing I'll say on that is, uh, the way has been opened in Ontario with provincial legislation to have ranked balloting at the city level. Oh. And I think what is needed to have a proper civilized debate about this is an actual demonstration project right. on the ground that people can go, okay, that's what it looks like. Yeah, I'm sorry that one of the provinces didn't do it. I mean, it's too bad about BC and Ontario. We well, that's right. And, and well, what happened in the Ontario referendum was it very quickly became a referendum on do you want to live in Canada? Right? The, the people who were opposed to the proposal said, this is the system they have in strange foreign places like Belgium. And, yeah, yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. and people who 364 of the days of the year would be grinding their teeth at how inane and stupid our politics is, suddenly rallied around and said, this is the system that has worked, served us well for 150 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you need, I think you need a, a demonstration project where you can, you can look at it, you can, you can say either it worked or it didn't, but the world didn't end. You know? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's very true. Well, maybe one last question, then we'll turn it over to our audience here. It's sort of, you, you, you're an expert, really, in, in the economy in many ways. You looked at the, uh, the economic platform of, of, the, of the Liberals as they go forward. What are your thoughts about it? What, what, uh, what it, reflections would you give? It was them? less reckless than they would like you to believe. If you looked at the, if you looked at the, the, the bottom line spending on the, on the liberal platform. It had this eye-popping thing of you know, $146 billion. And I'm sure they were perfectly happy for some people to think they were actually gonna spend $146 billion Where's more dollars. Where's the defense department in there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't see them getting much. <laughs> no. But the biggest chunk of that was just they were gonna replace a lot of the existing family and child tax credits with a single reform plan, which I think is the best single thing in their platform. I think that is a well-designed, program that's going to deliver more aid to, to poor children and that's, you know, that's, you know, has to be the good and it's phased out in an intelligent way as income rises. Uh, so you take that big chunk out of it. Um, basically, you know, to really simplify it down, the NDP were promising to raise spending annually by about $10 billion and they're going to raise taxes and spending equally so, you know, keep the budget in balance on a budget of about $300 billion. So, you know, it's an increase, but it's not, uh, not a huge thing. And the Liberals, basically the platform amounted, amounted to, will raise uh, taxes by about $5 billion and will raise spending by $15 billion and will cover the difference with $10 billion in borrowing. Well, you know, I didn't think it was terribly necessary. I thought it was mostly for show, to show that they were different than the NDP. I'm a fiscal hawk, but $10 billion deficits on a $2 trillion economy is a pinprick. Yeah. Um, I may say, I don't think it's, it, it's going to do us any harm, but it's too small even from a Keynesian term thing to do much good. Yeah. If you started delving into the spending, only a slice of it was for the fabled infrastructure that's going to raise all our productivity, et cetera. Mostly it was just things they'd like to spend on that they didn't want to have to raise taxes for. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was mostly inoffensive. If you were finance minister, would you recommend getting back to a putting a cent or two back on the GST? If, well, depending on what you mean, yes. Uh, they shouldn't have cut it. Yeah. In my opinion, not because that put us in the poorhouse, because uh, spending, the, you know, the supposedly typist of Tories raised spending per capita after inflation to levels we have never seen in this country. Spending right now, the, the, I think it's eight of the top 10 spending years in history of Canada after inflation per capita are under this government. So it's not because of, of the GST cuts that we went into deficits, because they couldn't control their spending. And then of course in the 2009, they ramped it up by $40 billion. What I object to is, if you're gonna cut taxes, you should cut income taxes. Yeah. The sales taxes are the least damaging to productivity, to savings, to investment, to incentives. 
uh, and I would rather see people uh, you know, focusing on cutting income taxes. I think there's ample room for one party or another to, to say, let's make a bonfire of all of these special tax preferences and credits and deductions and exemptions that we've built into the system. And the Tories, again, so supposedly the free market party, supposedly the party against social engineering, yeah. uh, brought in all these social engineering tax the credits to, tax, to the, tell you how to raise your kids. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, so I think, it, I think there's an opening for some party to say, let's get rid of all those. Let's do, do another one of those big tax reform exercises we do every 40 or 50 years in this country. Broaden the base, lower the rates. Uh, and the reason I think there's some urgency to that is the biggest challenge we're facing as a country, and I bore people to tears with it, but it's, it's there, is the aging of the population. Uh, that you know, we have never seen anything like what the, the, the exp not even the experiment, but the sociological phenomenon we're going through over the next 20 decades, 20 years, where we're going to go from uh, what was it uh, uh, 12, 13 percent of the population over 65 to 25 percent, and it's going to stay there for the rest of the century. By, by it's going to reach there by about 2030. If you go back to the early 1970s, I think it was six percent of the population over 65. So this is a, just an utter transformation. Uh, it's going to impose enormous costs, and I say this as a future old person, uh, uh, but old people cost a lot to look after, mostly for health care. It's going to be a huge challenge for the provinces. There are credible forecasts that one or more of the provinces 20 or 30 years from now could be, could be going bankrupt if on a business as usual basis, which doesn't mean it will, but it just shows you the challenge. Um, it's a, it's a, Bill Robson, the C.D. Howe Institute, has worked out that the, that the increased Sort of tax burden, if we covered it all by raising taxes, it's on the order of 7% of GDP, which is much as, as much as we raise through the personal income tax system. So it's another personal income tax system on, on top of the one you were already paying. Uh, it's a big challenge. Yeah. And the only, we, we, there's lots of things we could try to do. We can have more immigration and try to encourage people to have more kids and try to alter the demographic thing, but you really, the numbers are so overwhelming that the only thing that can really address it is if we raise on a sustained basis, productivity. If we can get productivity growth to go up you know, another half a percentage point per year beyond what it is now, and keep doing that for 30 or 40 or 50 years, then the next generation or two will be so much wealthier than we are that they can afford to pay for yours and my health care when we're old. So we have a vested interest, those of us who are around now, to get started on this project. And if you're of my persuasion, you would think one of the things that can contribute to that is getting marginal tax rates down to the level that's consistent with the social programs we want to fund. But broadening the base and lowering the rates, it seems to me, is a, is a no-brainer. And that's, but productivity is something that, in my reading, we've been told that basically Canada's been very bad at in the last 10 I mean, years. Relatively product, speaking, I, yeah. And, it, and it's, it may be a problem, having said all that, it may be a problem that to some extent will fix itself. And the, the, I'll say that for two reasons. One of which is, one part of it may well have been We've, we've had the most rapid ra labor force growth of any developed country over the last 50 years. Uh, and so we've basically been you know, increasing our national wealth by just adding more workers. And it, it, so to put it in very crude terms, if you're a company, rather than invest in, company, in, in plant and equipment and raising the productivity of your existing workforce if you needed to expand, you just took on more workers. So it was kind of a cheap labor strategy. So if that inverts, if we have relatively fewer people of working age around, which is the other half of this challenge in terms of the paying the costs, the one good thing about that is it may, the, the, the offsetting benefit of it is companies may, instead of being able, because they can't add more workers, may have to invest more in plants and equipment and just make their existing worker, workers more productive. So that, it may fix itself. And the other thing is we've got a big increase in national income over the last 10, 15 years from high oil prices. And so... That's the other way you get wealthy. One way is you raise your productivity. The other is if the world's willing to pay you insane sums of money uh, for the stuff that's coming out of the ground. Uh, and we, we absolutely should take that money, and we did, and we got, all got wealthy, not just Alberta out of it. We, the whole country got wealthier as a result of it. But it did tend to depress productivity levels because you didn't really need to invest in productivity. You could just collect this, this sort of manna from heaven. If that's gone into, who knows, permanent reverse, uh, then, then we'll, you know, I think things will shift back into productivity and in, 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 in that kind of investment. So to some extent, the problem is self-correcting, but I wouldn't want to bet on it. And there's still a lot we can do and should do anyway to improve our productivity, getting our tax rates down, and most of all, um, much more competition. There's still large sections of our economy that we're running as cozy little duopolies 
or, or cartels, you know, the, the, the telecoms business, we're still protecting from foreign competition, the, the transportation business, uh, we still have some large state corporations that are being run on a monopoly basis. Why we still have a monopoly state uh, post office is bizarre to me, particularly since Canada Post has said they're going to stop delivering the mail. <laughs> so we're, pr we're protecting by statute their monopoly in a service they refuse to provide, yeah. which just makes no sense to me at all. So at least the liquor store is selling liquor. <laughs> monopoly as it is. Touché. Touché. Well, on that note, I think it's, we better turn it over to our audience, who I'm sure have got some questions. Yes, sir. So we got about. Hey, thank you. Hello. There. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have two names for you: um, Nigel Wright and Senator Doug Finley. I think the departure of those two epic figures under, of course, different circumstance may have set the stage for the debacle that happened. Could you kind of look back in time and bring that forward? What might have changed with those two steady hands on the wheel? Well, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigel would have been your contemporary. Nigel right? was my contemporary, so I should say a few words about Nigel. And, and, um, uh, I would be among those who have believed that Nigel is, uh, you know, one of the uh, brightest and most responsible people that I've known. And certainly in university, we all thought that. And everything he did uh, since then was not only uh, somebody with high ethical standards, one would have said, but also great judgment. Uh, he was the guy who was, you know, it was his job was the, to do diligence. Um, having said all that, I can't say that he showed either in the matter of the Wright Duffy affair. I, 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 I try to withhold judgment as much as I can, but from what we have learned to date, uh, it's hard for me to say that he made the right call, needless to say. And everything that went after the payment, uh, he was at the center of. Uh, the, the attempt to tamper with the audit and these kinds of things. So I, I, I interpret it as being this is somebody who is, I think, a good person, but got caught up in the maelstrom of politics and maybe lost sight of where the lines needed to be drawn. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that if he was, if he was there that you know, everything would be fine. Whatever it happened, and Senator Finley as well. Yeah, well, he was, he was certainly a very skilled political operator. I, 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 uh, I also hold him to account in that I think he was a big part of the, the shift in, the, in Tory political strategy, this very hard-edged, very hardball, take-no-prisoner style. And I don't think that has served either them or the country very well, to be honest with you. Jack? Thanks, Bill. Uh, my question for, uh, for Andrew Coyne is, uh, of the, uh, all the political figures you've observed over the past quarter century or so, who has most pleasantly surprised you and who has most disappointed you and why? Huh. Uh, Leave uh, out anybody in the room when you're <laughs> in the room. <laughs> <laughs> A few politicals out there. Oh, boy. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, off the top of my head, I guess, uh, and this will be un unfortunately too easy and too, too obvious, but I mean, Justin Trudeau has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, um, he, as I say, he's worked hard. He's shown good political instincts. He's got smart people around him. Um, I still get unnerved looking at videos of him from about three years ago. And there's a part of me that says nobody changes that much. Um, uh, but he's definitely uh, done his homework and, and put his head down and, and, and tr tried to improve. And, and, um, and to give him his due, ran not just a very strong campaign in terms of winning, but a creditable campaign, a campaign that was based upon treating people like adults and, 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 and not uh, trying to whip up uh, fears and things. I hope that remains a strategy. That'll be the interesting thing to see, is when he's not the fresh young challenger, but he's the incumbent four years from now, do we still get the positive uplift campaign or do we get the fear campaign about don't, for God's sakes, don't vote for that other party? And I, I, I hope, let's say, that, that he, he sticks to the high road. It, it seems, I mean, I to give him his due, he does seem to have one of the, again, things from his upbringing perhaps is, and it gets him into trouble sometimes, is this kind of the self-assurance, uh, but it also, self-assurance also means I don't think he needs to beat up on other people to show that he's a big guy. Uh, and that's one of, the, one of the positive aspects of that kind of self-confidence. Um, and you know, the other obvious answer is, uh, is Stephen Harper. I, I was somebody who defended Harper in the early days when people said he'll never get elected. And I said, you gotta understand, this is a very impressive guy. He's very smart. He's very, you know, 
forceful and determined and, and, and has, I think, a real, a real presence when he, when he wants to. Um, um, and and, and uh, has an enormous achievement to his credit in terms of building that party up and, and, and winning the elections. And as I say, I think I didn't agree with a lot of the things he did in the minority years, but I guess a lot of people um, wanted to suspend or to, to give him the benefit of the doubt when he formed the majority government that maybe he would smarten up now that he'd gotten through this sort of desperate tumult of the, of the toing and froing of the minority parliament. Now that he had a majority, maybe he would um, ease up a bit and be a bit more statesmanlike, and it didn't happen. Uh, so I think he was kind of a prisoner of his own um, either uh, over-calculation, it became too hardened, too cynical, and, and, and these accumulated uh, resentments that seemed to have animated him a lot. And he, he, I think he could have been a, a very fine prime minister, and I don't think he'll be, um, in the end, I don't think he'll be uh, rated that way. And so that's, a, that's sad, you know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. representation, and you write rather influentially on that kind of thing. I've had there no influence two whatsoever on aspects. this or any other subject. <laughs> Let me assure you. Uh, there are two aspects that I'd like to draw to your attention, because I have the opportunity to meet a lot of people from different countries where they do have proportional representation, and I usually ask them about you know, how they feel about certain things. Um, the issue of the continual minority jockeying, sometimes not, is, is a very real one. You mentioned Belgium. They didn't have a government for two years yes. and were ruled by the civil service, yes. by the bureaucrats. So that's, that's one. The other is that most people do not feel connected to a member of parliament in that system. It's, Bill raised the issue that when he was a member, he was the member for the whole riding. And I think that feeling is reciprocated. Once an election is passed, everybody in a particular riding, by and large, thinks of the member as their member. Mm -hmm. And so if they have a problem, an issue, they'll go and speak to that person. Yeah. In many of the European countries, there is not that feeling that as an elector, as a, an ordinary person, you have somebody to go to. And I think whatever proportion, whatever plan is developed eventually, I think that's one of the best things about our system, and we should find some way of retaining that. Oh, I entirely agree. Yeah. I mean, there's many different systems, as you know, and every system has to be tailored to the country that it's, it's living in. In this, in this country, you're, let's put it this way, you're never going to get support for any system that did not have local representation in a right. country that's 3,000 miles wide, right? That's just a given. It's going to have to have some aspect of, of uh, of local representation. One model, as you're probably familiar, is the German mixed member system where some of them are chosen off party lists who don't have to be ranked by the party leader. You can have the voters pick them off the list. And the other half are, are elected in the ridings just as they are now. So mm -hmm. that's one hybrid system. I prefer myself, at least at a provincial level, the single transferable ballot that I was talking about earlier, the, the BC model where you have local MPs, but you might have three or four of them or five of them from a, from a riding. Um, and I actually think you might get some useful uh, competition between the, between the members in that regard. The other thing I would say is, uh, you know, hard cases make bad law and they make maybe bad politics. Uh, uh, Belgium is one example, and usually people say, well, that's the system in Israel or that's the system in Italy. Uh, they don't say, well, that's also the system in Sweden and the Netherlands and Germany and some pretty well-governed places. It's, you know, proportional representation is actually the norm internationally. It's, it's in dozens and scores of countries. And so I always say, you know, it, it, to, I'm not making issue with you, but when people raise uh, Israel or Italy and say we can't have proportional representation because that's the system there, I always say, well, that, it's akin to saying we can't have first past the post because that's the system in Zimbabwe. <laughs> you know, there are good and bad examples, and nobody wants the system in Israel, uh, which is a very extreme form, form of proportion, proportional representation. Although having been there, I came away with the belief that that's the only system that could work in Israel. When you've got... It's a pretty lively political they would have tw They would have 27 parties no matter what system you had. Yeah. And when so many of them are based on sort of religious affiliations of various kinds, which, on which there's not a lot of compromise you can make, if you had first passed the post in Israel, you could get a majority with 10% of the vote. Yeah. Right? And, and, and you, know, you could best believe that party would then insist on having its way. It, it, 
I think that the, it's such a wonderfully fractious and, and lively and disputatious country that I think they have the system that's probably appropriate for them, but obviously nobody wants it here. No, but you're quite right. I mean, sometimes in Toronto Centre, there'd be 13 people running. I used to say I could win this election with, you know, as you say, right. 10 or 12% of the vote. It was right. insane, really. Yeah. If, it, if it weren't for the fact that only, really, there only are three or four serious candidates in any one riding, if, yeah. the, if you know, if you got, if they all were serious, it would be, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, our first past the post wouldn't work no. because we would turn the country over too for, regularly yeah, to, for, I mean, to first, fringe craziness. First past the post works very well in a two-party system, yeah. and it tends to drive things towards a two-party system. Yeah. But if the mold is ever broken, as it was in Canada in the 1920s, yeah. uh, then it just leads to crazier and crazier anomalies Regi and distortions. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you say that, because as you said, it, can, it also, regionalization, like social credit, and remember, the, they would, it became regional things. But don't you think when you look at the map today, can we say that at the moment, given the results of the last election, that we're now in urban-rural divided? I mean, apart from the Maritimes, where it's kind of all, all red and so it's rural, but yeah. looking across the rest of the country, it's this a pretty election, urban, yeah. rural. This election of, particularly, it was, it was less so in past elections. People used to say, oh, the Liberals were winning the cities and the Tories were winning the hinterland, but in the, in the 2011 election, it was more metropolitan versus everywhere else. So the, right. the Tories were actually winning in cities last time. This time around, you're absolutely right. Uh, outside of Calgary and Edmonton, uh, the Liberals basically swept the, the, the central cities. And that's got to be very concerning for the Tories, you would think. Um, you know, the Tories have adopted the strategy in recent years of, of sort of walling off from their support base, university educated people. Well, what is one of the growth areas in our society is people, more and more people are going to university. So that doesn't seem like a real growth strategy. Mm -hmm. They were making inroads among minorities, but I think they probably did themselves some damage this election on that regard. Right. Uh, and those, Jason Kenney notwithstanding. Yeah, and, and those also tend to be found in cities, so you're not going to do terribly well with cities there. It's, they need to really rethink, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is just in terms of growing their base, they need to rethink this kind of very heavily divisive approach. And just to finish this point is, if we do get electoral reform, of some kind, or even even just a ranked ballot, that will absolutely kill stone dead this strategy of saying all we need to do is get 37 percent of the party of the vote that's just solidly with us into hell with the rest. They will absolutely be forced at that point to change the strategy. Sir, last question. I uh, from the Beatles. Uh, I think I was <laughs> most and former dean of of. Uh, this gentleman. Oh, no, uh, <laughs> All right, I, uh, I'll pay the fine. <laughs> um, With interest. <laughs> the, things, the things that really appall me about what the Conservatives did is what appears to me to be a sort of a pseudo-creation of an executive function in the PMO. Uh, so that, in fact, I don't even think they're listening to the Cabinet very much in terms of making those decisions. To me, that's the worst thing. That, that the Conservatives did. Do you think that Trudeau was aware of this, and do you think he has got any power to change it? Uh, he's certainly aware of it, because yeah. it's become a more salient issue in this election than I can ever recall. Michael Ignatieff tried to make an issue of it in 2011, but yeah. couldn't really get a hearing. I think partly because he didn't really have very serious, forgive me, but didn't really have very serious, substantive reform proposals that could really make people think he meant business. This time around, the Liberal platform has a lot more meat to it on that regard, partly because, as I say, the issue has become more top of mind for a lot of voters. It's become part and parcel of this whole approach to governing. To be fair to the Tories, and again, I'll have to apologize to Bill, this has been happening over parties of both True. stripes well, for, sure. for well, many for sure. years. And, yeah. and to be to Justin Trudeau's credit, including Justin's he, father. he has said openly, it began with my father. Yeah. Uh, and but it, and, and that's, this is the thing is we've been having over successive changes of government is each government comes in promising to fix the mess left by the previous government. Like, yeah. right? you know, Mulroney came in to fix the mess, democratic and otherwise, left by Trudeau and his high hindedness, and things just got kind of worse under, for, in various ways under Mulroney. And then Kretschmann came in and going to clean up the mess left by Mulroney and left his own messes, you know, put in the sponsorship scandal. Not okay. personally responsible, but you know, um, and, and, uh, and then, you know, Harper came in and they, they had the Accountability Act when they first passed it, which had many good things in it and cleaned up a lot of things that needed to be cleaned up. 
Uh, but you know, the, the, the temptation to uh, uh, you know, accumulate power in the prime minister's office has just gotten more and more, and the accountability has gotten less and less. And our system, this is the dilemma we're facing is, our system doesn't have a lot of the formal checks and balances that the American system does. Uh, and it depends upon a lot of conventions. And, and in some other Westminster democracies, those conventions are a little bit more alive than they are here. We've allowed a lot of them to become degraded. And so if you don't have either the conventions you know, locking people's behavior in or the checks and balances, then you're just kind of hoping that decent chaps will run things. And if decent chaps don't turn out to be that decent, then you're in a lot of trouble. I'm uh, just hoping that this new government will respect parliament. I mean, we've gone to all this trouble to elect it. It might be an idea if the government Absolutely. actually well, he, respected and it. And he has, he has, to be fair to him, he's campaigned on this. There are some serious and substantive proposals on this. Good. It will be deeply disappointing if he, if he doesn't, yeah, I agree. But doesn't but I follow through. I think there's a sincere effort. But I do have to sure. say that there are some structural reasons why you get this. I mean, in my own experience as foreign minister, I mean, every foreign minister in the world I ever talked to regretted the days of the foreign ministers of Palmerston and everything, when foreign ministers were really the foreign minister. Yes. Now the prime minister in every, in every country, the leader is the foreign minister because yeah. there's an integration between domestic politics mm -hmm. and international politics in a globalized world that makes everything relevant. So there, the foreign minister is really you know, an aid to the prime minister in a way that in an earlier time that was not true. And I think that's probably true of well, all the ministries. So you have to kind of figure yeah. out how to make that work and give the parliamentarians through the committee process and everything an input into all that, and, and that's a bit tricky. And, but to be fair to you, um, um, I think most people would say you were a serious and substantive foreign minister. We've had some foreign ministers since that I don't think people would say that was really the best and brightest we could find. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of these things, uh, uh, unfortunately, become self-reinforcing loops. It's not just the powers of the prime minister, though we have an urgent matter, in my opinion, of, to, to, to restrain and, 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 and change the balance of power between the prime minister's office and parliament. Yes, it's a parliament. matter of some urgency. But it's also the powers of the party leaders in general versus the caucus. And I mentioned earlier yeah. changing the way that we choose the leaders. That's not going to happen, frankly. But we, there are lots of other things we can do uh, to, to rebalance the rights and prerogatives of ordinary members of caucus versus, uh, versus the leader. The Chong bill, uh, which did get passed in very watered down form, is a useful start. I, you know, yeah. I, was, I was disconsolate that it was, it was so watered down, but it's, it's not nothing. It started. And there'll be a critical moment in a few weeks' time, which is when the, because the, the way the bill was watered down was, it said that the powers that it would give, it would give more powers to the caucus, particularly to dismiss the leader. It doesn't get to choose them, but they, do, they would get to dismiss him. Uh, and they would, there, there's some, some other things. These powers would, would accrue to the caucus if the caucus so voted after uh, each election. So there'll be a moment in a few weeks' time, whenever it is, when the caucuses all meet, and, and it'll be something to watch to see, do they actually have the nerve and the gumption to step up and claim some of these admittedly limited, but more than nothing, powers that, they, that this bill would give them, or are they so cowed by the whips and the leaders that they don't even dare do that? And that'll be a real testing point as to whether we can get the ball rolling. Because yeah. for all the other reforms that you or I might like to see, I've definitely come to the view that the starting point has to be giving more power to the individual MP. It, nothing else that any of us might like to see an act is going to happen unless MPs have more authority to step out of line uh, and, and, and actually vote as their conscience or their constituents dictate, rather than just being utterly beholden. Uh, to the party leaders and the whips, and, and we've got a long way to go on that. Well, I think on that note, I think we should end. I don't see anybody else. And Andrew, Andrew it's my... Uh, you know, you know, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for your thoughtful analysis, your intelligence. Uh, you're a great credit to this college. Oh, thank, thank you very much, much for joining us Thanks. tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.